Good morning. A warm welcome to our meeting for the 4th of July on this cold winter's morning. And uh, this morning, welcome Jen from the Hub Church, uh, accompanied by Marius from the Bible Chapel. Uh, come and join us at the table. Oh, sorry. Yes, my mistake. On to green. Yes. I'm, on, I'm on for green. Kia ora koutou, your worship, the Mayor, uh, War Boys, Deputy Mayor and Councillors. Uh, ko Jan, taku ingoa, ko Hub Church, taku whare, karakia. Keep every opportunity to practice my te reo. <laughs> uh, this is Marius and he's from uh, the Bible Chapel and he'll be doing the prayer next month. So he's just come to check us out and see how it's done. Uh, thank you so much for the privilege of opening your proceedings this month with prayer. Uh, I'd just like to start with just a short moment of silence, just to gather our thoughts and our senses, uh, then I'll pray. Father of us all, Thank you for the men and women that give of themselves to serve our district, making important decisions, big and small, that affect us all in so many ways. I ask for your wisdom, courage and unity as the ideas and plans are presented, discussed, debated and decided <coughs> inside and outside this chamber. May each person that has the opportunity to speak in this place present themselves and be received with dignity and mana. I ask that your time today would be fruitful as you work through the agenda. May your favour, Lord, be on every person employed at the District Council so that their work and lives may be fruitful. E tō mātou mātua i te rangi, ki a tapu tō ingoa, ki a tai mai tau rangatira tanga, ki a mētia tau e pai ai ki ronga ki te whenua, ki rite anō ki tō te rangi. Ho mai ki a mātou ai anei, he tāro mā mātou mō tēnei rā, murua o mātou hara, me mātou hoki e muru nei. I o te hunga e hara ana ki a mātou, aua e hoki a mātou e kawea ki a whakawaia. Engari whakaorangia mātou i te kino, nau hoki te ranga tiratanga, te kaha me te kororia. Ake, ake, ake. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, anything you'd like to share um, going on in, um, in with your congregation and the people you work with? What are you seeing out there in the community? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the Hub Church and uh, Life Point Church, uh, Jocelyn Stevens, who's been here before, uh, we, we combined together this last term to do um, a course called Emotionally Healthy Relationships. We had 24 people um, go through that course. That was an eight-week eight, eight week course and just giving people real tools to, um, practical tools to support um, processing of emotions and feelings and then how to talk to somebody else about that. Um, so that's been really good. We just had our last one last night and uh, we'll repeat that again next year. And we, we open that up to all the churches. And, um, I mean, it's available to anybody. So we're starting small. Um, this is the third course I've facilitated over the last three years doing that. So that's been really good. Um, the, the combined churches had a function together, a, a city prayer meeting uh, one Sunday night in... I don't know, about a month ago now. Um, and we had at, uh, we gathered at uh, Vision Church um, 
And we had a great night there, just praying for our city, praying for you all, uh, praying for uh, our district. And um, yeah, and we'll have another uh, combined gathering together in September that we're planning, a Sunday evening. Um, and um, we'll probably have that at the New Life Church this time. And we're starting to think about Christmas. <laughs> um, and what, what we could do for the community at Christmas time. So, um, yeah, those things are coming up. And, well, it's mm. July already. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. It so, is. Um, yeah, those, those, are, those are things coming up. And, um, yeah, just enjoying being part of Fielding and uh, the people that come and are interested and participate uh, really, really well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for giving up your time to open our meeting this morning. Welcome, Marius. We look forward to um, to working with you next month. And um, thank you for your time. And thank you for what you do in the community. And have a good day. Thank you very much. OK, item two. Um, <coughs> No apologies, Councillor Underwood is on approved leave. She may zoom in this morning. So we can go straight to item three on page six. This is the confirmation of minutes. Uh, can I have a mover and a seconder for the recommendation, please? Councillor Ford. Hey, Your Worship, I move that the minutes of the Council meeting held on the 20th of June 2024 be adopted as a true and correct record. Thank you. Uh, do I have a seconder? Councillor Quigley. Thank you. Any discussion? Councillor Hadfield. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> look, uh, under MDC 2225698, um, adoption of the long-term plan, um, it's it's my view that uh, in working through the council agenda of the 20th of June, uh, there were changes uh, noted by elected members <coughs> uh, that were made. Um, yeah, you know, my view is that the minutes should actually reflect that there were some alterations made uh, as suggested by elected members on the way through. Yeah. And I and and the reason I make that comment is for for clarity and transparency, uh, because at the end of the day, I know I made comments around a statement that was made on page one thirty one, one thirty two of the last council agenda, uh, which in my view was significant enough to actually warrant and other elected members also made uh, comments and so so there should be in my view a reference at least to changes that were re recommended by elected members otherwise how do we know that actually that happened and if we look back on stuff how do we know that actually that action has been taken thank you Shane. We can do a summary of that. The strategy team will have those notes and we can make a note and appendices those changes to the minutes. And 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 I think that would actually be the epitome of transparency and clarity. Yep, no problem with that. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Wedra. Thank you. Um so in that case, do we need to amend our recommendation subject to the um changes noted in the LTP? Document. Um, I think that uh, we just note on. Sorry. I think we just note in these minutes that we'll uh, amend those minutes with that appendices and that notation. Thank you. Um, okay. With that said, I have a mover and a seconder. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. Aye. Motion is carried. Welcome, Councillor Underwood. Can you hear us? All right. Yes, she waved. Oh, she did. Sorry. Yes, I can. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, item four, declaration of interest. Anything on the agenda today? Elected members may wish to declare. Nothing? Okay. We have no public forum, no presentations, no late items or recommendations from committees. So we can go straight to our community committee minutes and youth council. Um, as usual, these are loaded onto the council's website in full detail, but this is an opportunity for liaison councillors to uh, highlight anything from their community committee. Um, 
We'll start with Cheltenham. Now, who's got Cheltenham? Andrew, that's right. Thank you. Um, no, they, they've gone to a meeting every three months and really there's been nothing to report. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blackmore for Colleton. Um, nothing new to report since last time. Thank you. Uh, Himatangi Beach, um, I attended the last one um, in replacement for Andrew. Um, it was a very good meeting. I was um, I was pleased to see that the, there's a bit of a reshuffle around the committee and it seems to be functioning very well. They held their op shop ball on Saturday night, which I attended, um, which was spectacular. There was 90, 90 plus people there, all dressed in ball gowns and tucks, and um, they had a great night. So, um, and and the other thing to pass on the comments from the beach people was the actual village looks very smart, neat and tidy. Um, the footpaths have had a um, bit of work done on them, all the edges trimmed, and I thought it was looking very sharp, so well done. Councillor Ford, Kiwatia. Thank you. Uh, yeah, meeting very recently, probably on the 26th of June. Uh, I think 10 attended, 20 the last time, so we're getting pretty good numbers for a little... Um, more than a crossroads, as they call themselves. Okay. Uh, working on hall improvements. They're also, um, to make the hall more attractive for letting, they're wanting to talk to the neighbour about perhaps being able to either um, use a little bit of the land outside, just so that there's, an, there's a, an outdoor place to go, say for 21st weddings, that sort of thing. Because uh, at the moment, the boundary's sort of right up against the, um, the, the hall itself. Um, so that's just early stages, but they're they're in good heart. Thank you. Great. Councillor Underwood, Rongatia. Nothing new to report there. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Councillor Blackmore, the Youth Council will be busy for this Saturday. <coughs> yes, um, I missed uh, Monday's meeting. I was away, and thank you to Alison for um, stepping in. Uh, but the, yes, the big thing for them is Youth Fest this Saturday at the Civic Centre between 11 and 3, and I think you all have an invitation in your calendars for that, so it would be great to see if you can pop in. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Right, uh, let's... Councillor Campbell. Sorry, just my comment. Um, I attended the um, Total Reserve Advisory Group a meeting last Thursday, which is hosted by Horizons. We, while the council doesn't have... Any direct involvement in Total Reserve, they're quite keen to maintain a relationship with this council. And the, there's representatives from the Ponghana Valley Community Committee there, and they invited me to attend as well, which I did. Um, yeah, it was quite interesting. Um, uh, but one point that came up was I understand, well, they understand there's work progressing quite well on replacing the Churchill Road Bridge. Perhaps would Hamish be able to give us a quick update on that? Is that happening or not? Sorry, the Churchill Road Bridge is that about to be rebuilt? Uh, thank you, Councillor. I can come back with an exact timetable. It, it's in the the next three year period for the bridges that were taken out during Cyclone Gabriel. I don't have an exact construction timetable, but yeah. but it is to be replaced. Yes. Okay. Oh, that that was interesting because I wasn't aware of that. And um, yeah, that's that's good news, really. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was a big project, and I thought it might be years away, but obviously it's not. So yeah. Thank you. Um, also, while we're just doing catch up with our community committees, maybe um, our CE, um, I know Camp Rangi Woods, you've been involved in a couple more meetings. Would you like to give us an update on where we're at with that? Uh, I'll go to the short story, otherwise, the Deputy <laughs> Mayor might tell me, but um, it's progressing. Um, it's, it, it's, it is quite tricky. The community's really entrenched with. That facility. Um, they've had a community meeting and got quite good numbers there. Forty odd people turned up, which is not bad actually, um, to support Camp Rangywood. So um, the challenge now is if we want to withdraw as a trustee, who's going to replace us? And I have a meeting with the Horizon CE um, in a couple of weeks to talk about whether the Total Reserve Trust and the Camp Rangywood Trust could um, come together. Actually, that. 
Totara Reserve isn't a trust, it's just an advisory committee. But it's funded by Horizons. It's quite a good budget too that it's got. Um, over half a million dollars. So um, I, I just see there's a natural synergy between um, Camp Rangywood and the Totara Reserve. I mean, the land all that's part of Totara Reserve. So uh, we'll have that conversation in two weeks and uh, with a bit of luck that'll help us withdraw as a trustee and be replaced. Um, that then leads to y YMCA, who also want to withdraw because there's two trustees. Um, and the Pohongana Community Committee has voiced some um, interest in being the other trustee, which is the community component, which I think is also um, a good good move. And when you look at who's involved in that Pohongana Community Trust, there's some some wise old heads up in that part of the district and it's the Cullingham crew. So um, I think if we can get that over the line, then um, I'd feel quite good that the council walks away and it's still in good shape because I don't think it would be the right thing to do, just pull out and leave them in trouble. So um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we can reach some, you know, some agreement. Horizons don't want it as a Horizons asset, and actually we can't give it to them as an asset anyway because the trustee at Camp Ringerwood doesn't allow their assets to be passed on to anyone other than a charitable organisation. So. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hopefully that will be resolved. And it's great that the community um, want to retain it and um, keep it going. Right, thank you for that. Uh, they were for your information. So let's move to oh, item... Excuse me, Your Worship. We had... Uh, Councillor um, uh, McFadgen. Yeah, had the Helcom one on Monday night. You did. I sat in the car. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. well, yeah, anyway, we won't go there for now. Um, yeah, they, they've had a very successful community dinner. Um, it was oversubscribed, but they faced the issue that a lot of people, when it's free, said they'll show up and didn't show up. And that's always the challenge is when you actually give something away that has no value. That yeah. uh, So fortunately it wasn't the number, but if anyone's got any ideas on how to actually overcome that, they would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Short. I'd just like to give another update. Tangi Moana, and this one's for Hamish. Um, I need to come and talk to someone in the roading department Car versus deer out there is almost a weekly occurrence at the moment, and we've really got to, I don't know what we can do, but we've even if it's talking to some of the landowners and allowing some culling, it's <laughs> it's um, it's becoming more and more of a problem. So there was another one a couple of days ago. So and we've had there's been quite an online conversation with lots of suggestions from the community. So oh, you can point me who to go and talk to. <clears throat> Thank you. Right, um, so we'll move to um, officer's report item 10. Uh, this is uh, seeking to approve council's support for the consultation on the development of financial contributions policy and the development contributions fees. So I'll head over to our team. Uh, just just while our team are getting um, in place, um, we have been advised that the table that you have in that document with compa um, comparisons with other councils um, has been updated, so you'll see that on the screen this morning. Morning, councillors. Um, so I have uh, David with me, who's taking the lead on the will on contributions. Um, Hamish to answer any asset questions and also have Richard uh, with us who's done some work on uh, looking around what other councils charge and he's got a presentation which will well, actually Dave and him have got a presentation which we'll run through. Just a reminder though this item came to council back in February and we did a presentation to council and it was during the exec only time and we did that quite purposely because we didn't want uh, the then suggested numbers to be out in the arena too early uh, and prompt an a, um, avalanche of subdivision consents. Um, so we ran through that. Uh, the numbers have changed a little bit, but largely they're about the same as what they were. Um, the outcome, of course, is it's quite a significant 
uh, rise in our development contributions, but the team will run through uh, what's causing that, what's driving that and why. And uh, we'll answer questions as we go. So I'll hand over to David and we'll work through the presentation. Thank you. Welcome, David. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, good morning, councillors. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll walk through this presentation and I'll be handing over to <laughs> different people probably throughout it. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a roadmap of um, what the presentation will take you through. Um, so we'll whip through Development Contributions 101, just go over um, just the basics of, of what those are. I'll cover how MDC organises our development contributions, um, particularly how we organise catchments and HUEs, which are housing unit equivalents. Um, we'll then go through the short story about development contribution fees. As Shane alluded to, they have increased considerably. Um, so then we'll look at what principles underlie our approach, because um, that explains a little bit why they've gone up, um, as well as the variables, which are pretty much lower growth and um, higher costs. Um, we'll get down to the real business, which is what the impact on the DC fees are themselves. And then I'll hand to Richard, who's done some great work doing a bit of comparison work um, with other councils. Um, I say great work because he's been comparing apples of oranges with lions of lemons because it's quite a hard task to do that. But we've got some numbers for you to look at. Um, and then we'll get to the end, which is around the consultation process that we will follow. Um, what are development contributions? So these are, of course, fees charged for developments to encourage and support growth in the district. Um, pretty much it's so that new houses, subdivisions and commercial developments pay a contribution to um, the services that are related to the growth that they create. And that includes public infrastructure and network infrastructure, such as three waters, transport and reserves. Um, we have a, a development contributions policy. Um, so we must have a policy under um, sections 102, 197 and 197AB of the Local Governor Act. Um, the key purpose of a development contributions policy is to ensure that growth and the cost of infrastructure to meet that growth is funded by those who cause the need for that infrastructure. Um, one or two district councils um, development contributions policy in its current form was um, agreed last year, but every time we change the numbers, we just have to revisit the policy um, given that the numbers are intertwined amongst it. Um, what does that development contributions policy contain? Well, it gives an explanation, the rationale about why we charge development contributions, how we calculate them, um, talks about where development contributions apply, particularly catchment areas, and I will explain those um, in a minute. Um, it talks about the growth that the infrastructure development, sorry, the, what growth um, the development contributions um, or funds. So if you look at the back of the schedules, there's quite a lot of detail around the d different projects that development contributions fund. Um, talks about the process that can be used to reconsider um, development contributions when there are objections. And it also talks about the process of refunding um, contributions should developments not proceed. So that's what the policy does. Um, fielding, oh sorry, Manawa 2 has um, three catchment areas. So we have a fielding urban catchment area and a fielding intensification area um, and also rural and villages. Um, that's quite a simple catchment structure. Many councils have multiple catchments um, that they use. Uh, Palmerston North, for example, I think has about 15 from, from memory. So um, we have quite a, a simple, um, simple catchment structure, I guess. Um, in the rural and villages um, catchment area, development contributions fund reserves and transport infrastructure. In um, fielding urban and the in fielding intensification area, they fund water supply, wastewater, stormwater reserves and transport infrastructure. For the fielding intensification area, um, we apply a 0 0.65 um, differential to that area, reflecting that um, there's current infrastructure in place. And when we put new developments into that area, they use that current infrastructure. Um, at the moment, all growth infrastructure is um, in precincts four and five. So um, when you pay 
um, development contributions in the fielding urban area, that's where the money is um, going at the moment for infrastructure projects. Um, the other key concept um, in development contributions is this um, Huey or Huey um, housing unit equivalence. So this is kind of the uh, drawdown on infrastructure that we expect from the average household. Um, so you can see the demand there, you know, one cubic metre of water, um, eight cubic meter, uh, 0.8 cubic metres per day of wastewater. Um, I won't read those through. But that's, um, that's the demand pool that we would expect to see from housing unit equivalents. Um, and in um, Manawa 2, um, the number of Hueys charged for is one per residential lot. Um, again, that's uh, changes from council to council. Some councils overlay a lot of scalability across that, depending on the size of different um, houses and bedrooms and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we've chosen to have a reasonably simple framework. Can you just... Uh, sorry. Um, could you just elaborate on scalability? I'm sure, actually, Richard, I might get you to speak to this because you um, are the expert. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, certainly. So each council, as, a, as you'll see in the table later on, um, will calculate the different contributions somewhat differently. They have a concept within the local government act, essentially of housing unit equivalent. Not all houses are the same. Some have different numbers of bedrooms, some have different floor areas. Some councils will use those factors to say, well, actually, a small dwelling, say 80 square metres, is only um, 0.8 of what they consider an average household, which is, say, 100 square metres. And they'll do that with section size, they'll do it with um, some services uses as well. Um, I think impermeable services is another one I've seen as well. So, yeah, they'll, it's basically a fraction of what is that. that. So we have a simple one. I think we um, have some differentials or scaling factors for retirement and accommodation units of about 0.44, but it's, it's about the only one we use at the moment. Thank you, Richard. That will become an important issue, I think, if um, Brady Flats, that issue um, mm -hmm. comes live. Um, we might need to consider um, what kind of discount we give um, for those kind of um, developments. Okay. So um, we're on to the short story about um, why development contributions are increasing. So the short story is that um, growth projections have significantly reduced. Um, so when you look at um, Huey demand, for example, it's reduced from 2,900 approximately down to about 1,700. Um, so you're, you're basically spreading the costs over fewer people. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we know that significant growth infrastructure has been pre-funded um, in this district, so that adds in financing costs. Uh, but we've also um, seen, uh, because of the lower than anticipated growth, we've seen under-recovery um, from development contributions as well. And um, also, as we all know, construction costs and interest costs are significantly up. Um, significantly being a factor of, you know, 30% or so across um, three years. So what that really means is that we have less people to spread and increase cost over. Um, so you see some pretty significant lifts in development contributions for fielding urban developments and for, um, you know, it's 104% increase. Fielding intensification area developments, we'll see an increase of 97%, and we'll see an increase for 53% for rural and village developments. I'll dig down into a couple of those variables. Um, oh, sorry, I'll start with, <laughs> with some starting principles. Um, so, so I guess this these are principles that underpin the our approach um, as a council to our development contributions policy. So the first important one, is that our model is based on recovering 100% of growth-related capital expenditure from new developments. Um, so that's really consistent with how we've approached the LTP, where we have pushed the burden, cost burden of services away from ratepayers and more to those who use a service or benefit from the service. And so you see this 100% cost recovery and development contributions is that same kind of principle where we're saying the cost of growth-related infrastructure should be borne by those who are doing the developments who get the benefit from that service. Um, I mentioned the simplicity of our model. Um, what that means is um, it's pretty transparent. So we know, for example, that if you develop a um, 
a Huey in um, the fielding urban area, you'll be paying around about $53,000 for that in development contributions. Um, that's really different to other um, areas where, you know, if you look, go and look at Palmerston North, for example, because they've got multiple catchment areas with quite different charges for each one, and then they've got overlays of scalability across housing unit equivalents, it's actually really hard to get a feel straight up about how much you're paying. So that's a little bit about transparency, and I think that explains why um, we've we've got that reasonably simple um, model. Um, in terms of the variables that are driving the increase, so um, as I mentioned before, we've had lower growth. Um, so if you look at um, things like the bill indices we use, infometrics, you'll see that the population increases haven't um, have have kind of gone down in terms of the growth, um, populations are going down, the growth has. But when you factor that through into forecast QEs, you'll see um, you know, those numbers up there, 2,900 um, QEs going down to 1,700 for wastewater, water, um, stormwater. Um, those are significant decreases. So that means less households to pay um, for the costs. Then you overlay that with... Um, higher costs. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, David, what is the... If I'm, I'm just trying to understand that um, table. So the 2949 or the 1714, in fact, any of those figures, what time frame is, is that for my first question? <clears throat> um, 20 years, isn't it? Yeah, so our, our um, development contributions policy is based across 20 years. So it's... Right, okay. And then the other thing I'm struggling with is why the difference? I mean, we're talking about Hueys, but it looks like Huey, Dewey, and Louie because we've got different, you know, we've got percentages changing from minus 42%, minus 27%, minus 12%, minus 24%. So I can probably understand the difference when you get to transport and reserves because we're including uh, rural, but why is stormwater? Different. Oh, because of the villages. I'll pick that up. When, when you, as as David's outlined, when you when you're talking about a, a Huey or a household equivalent unit, when you when you're looking at a typical house, it's easy to compare one to one to one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you bring in a commercial or industrial site or something which is non-standard, um, you're essentially assessing that development based on a number of equivalent Hueys, if you like, and so a large uh, industrial development with a large um, a large, say, roof uh, building area and a large uh, hard stand car park area that will typically have um, higher levels of stormwater assessed against it because it's multiples of the, the 300 square metres that are assumed for a typical household, whereas they may only have one toilet or two toilets, they, um, but they may have a, a stormwater equivalent of 12 houses, for example. And so that's why you get a differential in the way that the 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 stormwater calculation is made. And it also applies to roading as well. So if they're a business that's got a lot of transport um, activity with trucks and cars in and out regularly, having a disproportionate impact on the network, um, that, that's a, it's a, it's a, it can be fairly subjective, but it is worked through between the offices and the, the, the developer or their agent in terms of what the actual activity will be. And so you, you do get a little bit of um, variability in terms of that stormwater and or... Um, transport calculation if i may um so the, the the previous forecast however was the same for stormwater wastewater water but but then the updated forecast has changed why would that be so in the new updated um schedule if you like we've taken into account the turners road uh, development and the kawakara industrial precinct and so with that, there's there's a number of assumptions made around what those industrial developments might look like down there, whereas before that probably wasn't fully um, fully taken into account. So you've essentially got a higher number of potentially different sized and shaped industrial units um, in that Kawakawa industrial precinct. Right, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and just going back to previous discussions we've had on these, I, I can sort of always recall that... Um, it was easy enough to uh, increase and decrease the work that we're doing as the market demand changes. Um, within reason, obviously, if you've started on a particular project, you've got to finish it. But um, 
so the question really relates to couldn't we just re if the market is slower which it is than it was a few years ago <coughs> couldn't we just slow down the rate that we're doing the work yep. uh, as opposed to doubling the DCs yep so through you your worship um, if if council recalls back um, in the LTP development um, Council meetings and workshops we did pre-Christmas. We had a number of discussions around the CapEx program as a whole. Um, and within that, we talked about the activity areas, um, but also specifically the growth funded um, works in relation to roading and three waters particularly. And so in there, we we did did exactly as you've outlined, um, Councillor Ford, in terms of spreading the, the work further, particularly in Precinct 4, Miowa. We looked at the... Um, the timetables and the build from the key developers up there. So we know we've got a couple of large developers. So working closely with them in terms of the phasing of their development, we essentially pushed pushed the um, the precinct four uh, work program out, um, which did exactly as you as you're saying. And given the the priority that council placed on Turner's Road in terms of finishing that section of infrastructure. And updating, uh, sorry, reopening up the the Kawakawa Industrial Precinct, um, that was brought forward into into year. As you recall, we had quite a discussion about doing it in year two and three, as opposed to year one and two. And so that was uh, that was the work that was done at the time to spread that work out. And we also did remove a number of projects that just simply weren't a, weren't going to happen, um, if you like. So it was a there was a lot of work done to do exactly that. <laughs> Do we have the ability to further spread that um, over over the years ahead? Yes, we do. Um, and, and you're quite right, Councillor Ford, we can um, not start a project if the market absolutely um, turns to custard, if you like. Um, but at this stage, we've, we've made those um, more pessimistic forecasts, worked with the developers, and what's in the development contribution schedule is reflecting what we know now. In a year or two or three, that may change for the better or for the worse. And we can adjust the the program, and therefore the DC would be adjusted accordingly. Thanks, Hamish. That's particularly helpful. So. Shane, councillors, um, just <clears throat> really do need to point out that um, a lot of this is changeable, and what we're doing today is looking at a policy that we want to go out to consult on, and there's the ability for people to. Um, Put in submissions, and then for council to have, and we'll have because I don't get we'll get submissions, um, a hearing to hear those submissions, and there is a process to go through where it is likely we may well consider some of the things that are being raised. Um, the important piece is, is this isn't finite today. This is just step one of a process that we need to go through to get to a, a approved development contribution policy and fees. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Thank you, Bishop. Um, Shane, I'm just really conscious, particularly around the consultation that we're about to do around the DC, there's just something that's really confusing here of the presentation that your team have given today and what's in our funding policy summary. So in our funding policy summary at 103, it talks about literally here, the district has experienced a period of high growth. Over the last five years, there's been an average of 187 new dwellings consented compared to an average of 173 for the previous five years. And then we have a presentation we were talking about the reason why we're increasing our DCs is because we didn't meet the intended growth that we were going to have. Those two messages are really confusing. Thank you. So, I also picked that up. That yeah, if you go back to that graph, you can see, yes, over the years since 2019, there's been an a, you know, exponential climb in growth and, and dwellings and new lots. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm just talking about the messaging of making sure that we're really clear okay. when it comes to the audience that we're about to have. If elected members here are confused mm -hmm. when we're looking at our um, funding policy summary and the presentation you're giving, I imagine the audience we're about to consult with might be a little bit confused too. Okay. And I would we support sure Council Bell. Right. I, I punned, mark that out as well because if, if the policy doesn't reflect what we're talking about, it keeps talking about growth. It's obviously written for when we did have the growth. Shouldn't we be changing that dialogue to reflect what we're trying to do now? We'll have a look at it. Yep. Uh, Councillor Hadfield. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Your Worship. 
you know, when, when, when I look at this graph and, you know, without actually doing too much research on it, probably some of this data follows uh, interest rates uh, a little bit in terms of what people can afford to do. And, and what we're proposing, uh, in my view, clearly would exacerbate that downward trend. And, and to, to pick up on Councillor Bell's comment that, you know, um, the, some of the projections we're making are, you know, possibly actually problematic is probably the word I'd use. And, and if we look at, um, I think we look at Schedule 2 and look at the future assets, and I looked at the first three years, you know, there's $17 million worth of 100% uh, DC funded projects in those three years, in the, in the next three years, just on uh, what's on page 75 of our, our agenda. Now, you know, clearly um, we're, running a, we're running a deficit now in our development contributions fund, and that potentially is only going to going to be exacerbated by, you know, what what we're proposing, uh, given that I would actually expect that downward trend to actually um, uh, magnify, you know, in terms of not only the market, because, you know, none of us are uh, economists or experts. Um, uh, the Deputy Mayor's probably got a bit of better, a better idea about what the market's doing in terms of um, housing and development. But... You know, we're, we're almost damned if we do and damned if we don't in some aspects here. And so I think, you know, we've actually got some, you know, my view is before we actually head out to consultation is are we heading out with just one option? So I just plonk it out there. Hey, Miss. Um, yeah, if I, to, to speak to um, Councillor Headfield's point, you're, you're exactly right. In those first few years, I'm really better write that down. Yeah. Um, in the first few years, that there is a significant investment in Precinct 5. So that is our Kawakawa Industrial Park. And we've talked around Turner's Road for, for many, many years around this table. And that was essentially the, the focus of getting the, the council's overall budget together as we were developing the long-term plan. And you recall, we shifted a number of projects around to make everything fit within our debt cap. And, and the point is exactly right, is that we are essentially borrowing that money um, to build the the program in the first three, four, five years, and Turner's Road is a significant expense in that first period, um, years two and three. And so there's a philosophical discussion of the demand is there, we need to meet it, versus build it and they shall come. And you can see on the graphs that I think are in the presentation, the the spend in that first year, there's a massive spike, and that is, that is Precinct 5, that is the Turner's Road extension to open up an industrial area. Your Worship, can I suggest that we move through the presentation yeah. um, and because some of these, especially the comparisons and all that, we've yet to show council. So I think, I won't say all the questions will be answered, but some of the detail that councils may want might be in that presentation. So let's move Thank through you. to that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So um, so we've talked about the lower growth. Um, higher costs, um, I'm not going to dwell too long on this because we talked about this um, a lot during the long-term plan, but as you know, interest rates um, are far higher than they were a few years ago, as well as construction costs. And we talked about the massive escalation in um, construction costs um, when you look at some of those costs of things like bridges, wastewater systems, uh, water supply systems. You can see um, how those costs that we've um, built into our capital budgets have gone up. What that means is um, our development contributions have, um, the proposed development contributions um, are increasing significantly. So you see the numbers there, Fielding Urban going from about $26,000 to almost $54,000. Um, intensification area, $19,000 up to um, about $39,000. And for rural and villages, $7,000 up to 11000 Now, that's um, quite alarming, but every council is facing this situation. And actually, um, when we did our initial comparison charts, it looked like we'd be near the top, but um, hot off the press overnight, a lot of councils have actually updated their development contributions overnight. Um, so I will hand over to Richard, who's done um, quite a bit of work trying to get a bit of a comparison feel for how Manawatu 
um, sits alongside other comparable councils. Richard. Right. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Your Worship and councillors. I'll start off with a, um, a few points of explanation before we get into the table itself. So I think it's important to understand the context that we're talking about. Uh, cool. We've already been introduced very briefly to the, the concept of scaling factors or conversion factors um, or differentials. Every council uses those slightly differently. There is a standard formula within the Local Government Act, which is basically capital cost of growth divided by number of um, units of demand, which we call housing equipment units or HOEs, which you'll see pop up. That's assumed on a sort of standard household. Every standard household, which councils um, use, sort of varies slightly. Some use three bedroom units, some will use a units of stormwater, some will um, use um, units of um, land area. And um, I can um, cite some of those examples if people that are curious. So in terms of how each council sets different contributions, there's a number of factors. The obvious one is how much growth they're having, how much um, infrastructure they're pre-funded, so often you're putting the infrastructure in the head of the growth, and this is exactly points to do that chart, which uh, we, we've just been seeing with our growth slowing. This, the growth hasn't gone away, we're still growing, it's just growing slower, so it's important to remember that. Our infrastructure, um, council infrastructure tends to be lumpy, but, and by that I mean that you tend to have large lumps of expenditure, um, you don't build, you know, um, 15% of a road or 15% of a sewer treatment plant, chances are you're building an entire stage to counter the next growth. We still have to pay for that in terms of putting that in place, and we also have to carry the debt until the development contributions are paid. So this comes back to why the units of growth and the growth rate becomes quite important. In some cases, we've already incurred the expenditure. We've based it, um, our previous development contributions on having so many units of development to repay the loan which we've taken out. If that rate of repayment slows, it means that we actually have to cover the additional cost of financing. So that's another driver for our development contributions. In terms of some of the other factors amongst other local authorities, the chart I'm about to show you, or the table I'm about to show you, there's a couple of other things that are occurring. There's a scale and the cost of growth. So every council is growing slightly differently. The infrastructure is slightly different. The levels of service associated with the infrastructure can be quite different. Some councils have two footpaths on our side of the road. Some will have one, some will have street lighting, some won't. It really depends on what level of service. So it's another thing that comes into the, the cost uh, that, that comes um, into the general contribution. Decisions as to the percentage of costs recovered through DCs. So we've just been through our long-term plan. We've gone through and looked at the elements which we need to spend our money on. Some are funded by rates, some are funded by targeted rates, some are funded by NCTA contributions. Um, and in other instances, um, that will be funded through joint contributions 100%. So that changes depending on where you are in a, in a town. We've got a three catchment model. The, the sample which I'm about to show you has, um, I've looked at 13 councils, for 13, 14 councils actually, um, and some councils have decided to um, have a range of cost recovery going right through from zero to 100%, which tells you that actually everyone's doing it slightly differently. Ring a ticket for whatever reason, um, have decided that they won't recover costs through different contributions. So they're sitting at 0%. We've gone the other way. A lot of our costs, we've gone to 100%, pushing, pushing the cost onto those who benefit, as David has um, talked about. Yeah. One of those things that drives that percentage of recovery uh, are things like our own growth rate, but also how much we can um, handle the debt, how sustainable our, our debt levels are. Because essentially, what's not funded by development contributions has to be funded by another means. That means either pushing the cost into rate pairs or stopping the works entirely, which is one of the things which you know, we've also talked about today. So that's another factor that comes in. Scaling conversion factors I won't touch on, but um, so we've talked a wee bit about it earlier, but um, different units or different scales of development have a different demand compared to the standard average house. <clears throat> Something which David also just briefly touched on was when I started doing the table, and if you look at the table yesterday, I'm, I apologise for this, um, multiple councils were still to publish their 2024 figures. Um, a lot of those came in literally within the last 24 hours, and the scale of our increases are not out of whack with what quite a few councils are doing around the country now. Um, I've covered off revenue sources, so perhaps we'll go into the table itself. Um, now, I apologise for the size of this, but the, that variability um, results in 
some rather interesting attempts to try and com compare. So I've concentrated on the ranges of residential development units, the residential hui at this stage, because as soon as you get into commercial or industrial, you start getting into a uh, bespoke formula. Um, it might be area of impermeable surfaces, which what Hamish talked about. It might be traffic movements. Every um, industrial development or commercial development will, will have, have a different um, level. So they often have a special assessment to do that. We're, we're no different. If you look at the, the range up there, you can sort of see that the development contributions on that table go right through from zero through to $73,000 um, per um, housing permit unit. Um, that one's sitting in Waipara, I believe, at the moment. In the uh, column uh, labelled um, Applied Asset Cost Recovery, you can see that range I was talking about. You can see that each council does it slightly differently. Um, and each catchment will often have a, have a different um, growth recovery percentage applied to it, and in some cases may have different scaling factors. So scaling factors range, range right through from sort of 0.2 through to 0.8, to, to, depending on whether it's a retirement unit, whether it's papakainga, whether it, it's a retirement village, whether it's a three-bedroom household. Um, we um, have a, a 0 0.44, 0 0.36, depending on its retirement village or accommodation. Palms North um, applies another level of complexity above that. They have what's called a 700 metre square uh, metre rule of um, where a hui for um, the stormwater, I believe, is actually applied on a per 700 metre basis. So if your section size is smaller than 700 square metres, you get a fraction of, 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 a, of a hui, which is um, commensurate with that. Richard, what do the red asterisks mean? Okay, so th those were the two councils as of last night that hadn't um, updated their, um, their their contributions policy. So it's possible that Marlborough will go higher again once the, once their figures have published. Quite pretty similar. So those are probably based on the 2021 uh, contributions policies for the councils. Um, although the Kuiper one is actually dated 2020, uh, but I believe it's adopted in 2021. Thank you. Also, Palmerston North City. I understand if you if you want to build up in Summerhill area, DCs are up to seventy thousand dollars, but yes. that's not reflected there. Yeah, it, it it depends on what you want want to add in, but you're quite correct. The, 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 these things can vary, and it's well called an indicative um, because as you add in different layers and different factors, some of those those will go up um, again. Um, same with Roxburgh Crescent, for example. That's higher than the standard residential, even though it's theoretically within the urban boundary. Mm. Um, because we've only got three catchment areas, uh, we've got a relatively coarse type um, uh, sample to work with, so we, we don't have that level of variability within it. So I, I guess the key me key message from this table is it's actually very difficult to actually compare a direct like mm. with a like. Mm. Okay, any any further questions on this one? I guess, you know, even with those updated mm. figures, um, we're still up there. <laughs> Councillor Blackmore. Thank you. And I think we probably covered this the last time we looked at it. But, you know, given that so much of this is kind of legislative and the principles around uh, allocation of cost where the... Um, benefit is. I'm really curious as to why Dangatike doesn't charge and how that, like what sits in behind that decision? Um, I think they use financial contributions. Okay. Um, which is another mechanism, yeah. which is um, basically through an RA process. Right. So there is a cost associated with development. Yeah. The villagers don't have development contributions. Okay. Um, just harking back to a point that was made earlier, um, and that we are up there. Yes, we are. But all the um, infrastructure work, not all, the majority of our big infrastructure work, like our wastewater treatment plant, even that that was done some time ago, there was a large component of growth um, built into the development of that plant. I think we almost doubled it, Hamish. I think we went to 1,500 cubes a day, 15,000 or something. Yeah, well, just the rent figures. Um, but also, councillors, you, you may recall some of you that um, you know, there was stormwater works done that went across um, Kimbolton Road and up Ferrison Street. There was a, a 1.8 metre pipe put in for the whole of that Maiwa precinct. Well, that was all done quite some years ago, but there was a considerable cost. So those costs are still there. It's still, um, you know, loans and, and 
development contributors may have paid off some of them, but just a reminder, just last year alone, we were 1.8 million behind in our development contributions. So all of that adds to the financial complexities that we're trying to address. Uh, and yes, we can slow growth works if that's what council requires, but we can't get rid of the historic expenditure that's already occurred and the money that's committed in those growth areas. Uh, another good example was we're just waiting on a resource consent for the stormwater detention ponds up in Myowa. Is that two million bucks, Hamish, or three, three including the land that we bought? Um, now that's for the whole of precinct. Eventually we'll catch up, but it's going to take 20 years to catch up. So we've got to fund that and we've got to finance it and we've got to pay the cost, which is interest and the like. Councillor McFadden. Thank you, thank you, Worship. I just have a question, really, and it's and it's not really exactly around the development costs. But do we have any um, data about what the section cost comparisons are? Because if we're looking to promote a fielding as a great place to come and live, doesn't actually the the comparison between the section costs plus the development cost really make up part of that picture? Uh, we can get it, um, and I'm sure um, that information will be available through our um, infometrics and the data that we get. So, yeah. Councillor Ford. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've talked about going back a page or two. Um, the costs have increased significantly. We've got, you know, 38% for bridges, et cetera, et cetera. And then we then... Now that's over a three year period, 2020 to 2023. And then we say that the producer price index, PPI, for one year, it was 3.2% increase. So I want, it's a little bit like the previous question about messaging. It doesn't seem to correlate particularly well. Um, but really, my question uh, is have we done any analysis? which I acknowledge would be guesswork <laughs> about the effect on the market of such substantial increases in DCs. Because mm -hmm. we've got a, a huge amount of information about why the costs have to go up, and we understand that. But have we done any analysis on what effect that might have? So, I mean, I'll just use an exaggerated example. If we went from, say, 26,000 to 150,000 development contribution, I think we'd all acknowledge the market would die, right? It would just, no one would buy a section because they, the, the um, developers can't just add that on to the price of a section. So my question is, if we and if we put them up $2,000, there'd probably be no difference in the market whatsoever. But at at an increase of 26 to 54 or whatever it is, um, what do we, or 104%, yeah, what effect on the market is predicted and have we done any analysis on that? No, and I'm not quite sure where we would start, but I think we will get a good feedback from developers around that over our consultation period. Yeah, I think we all know what they're going to say. <laughs> we, we know what they're going to say. Yeah. But, just but I don't know how you would do that. If you've got any ideas of how we will, how we would crystal ball into that space, then yeah. I'm welcome to hear it. But I don't know how you would do that, short of going out and asking the same questions that we're going to go out when we go out for consultation. Um, just to follow on from Councillor Ford, my thinking is, have we done any work around... The market is is down. It's slow at the moment, um, both national, uh, nationally, nationally, um, and so by my question is: Have we done some analysis about the market is flat and down, and we don't? Who knows how long it's going to sit like that? What is the impact of of more than doubling our DCs going to have? Could it actually make our position worse? Potentially. And, and I think that's something that we as elected members need to consider. You know, the timing couldn't be worse for, for, for having to do this. I'm not sure what the other options are, but, but have we considered that? Potentially, we're behind already in our DC payments. That could become worse. 
And and the timing is not dictated by essentially us. It's dictated by inflation, interest rates, high cost of construction, growth rates falling. Um, and the council is like every other organisation. Those are very real impacts on our financial situation. Um, you know, behind last year, 1.8 million in development contribution speaks speaks volumes of how much that growth has dropped off. Um, going back to Councillor um, Ford's, um, you know, we get caught with uh, in the local government act of having to use PPI, but then we get caught in having to use others like Burl and LTP, and they don't necessarily mix, they don't match. So the legislation points us in different areas, and 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 it is difficult for us. So um, going back to the point I raised, um, what does council have? Do you have something that you've done some work on about if if going through this process and the market is flat and stays like that for a while, and our situation becomes worse, what is the plan then? to deal with the issues that we're talking about. But I'm not what sure what you mean be? by the situation becomes worse. Well, if, if we're behind in DCs now yep. and we raise the DCs by over 100% so that the, the whole market just virtually stops or slows down even further, um, we're going to be even further behind if we carry on with the work capital works that we're talking about. So which is just going to add to council's debt. Have we considered that and how we would manage that? Yep. The, the reality is that we would be coming back to council mm. saying that we're going to defer the works program or we recommend that we have to do that. And mm. I come back to council Hadfield's earlier point that we've got a significant debt funded expenditure in the first three, four years, including our industrial precinct. And that is many millions of dollars, which is going to be debt funded. And that might be the the dead rat we have to swallow at some point. Um, but that is that is the reality of that specific situation. We're not there yet, but those are decisions that we will need to make. Uh, Councillor Hadfield. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Look, I, you know, what's interesting about this is none of us can, um, well, we can all navel gaze because you know, that's actually part of um, what we do in a, in a government environment, really, because um, nobody, you know, legislation forces us to do a whole lot of crappy things because because of crappy legislation and it, it's unproductive and it creates costs and everything else. I think we all we all get that. I think from my perspective, I get this. I think, you know, the, there's a very logical explanation as why charges need to be where they are. I think we understand that. But <clears throat> I think the thing for me is, and, and probably the point Councillor Ford made, and we can't navel gaze this, is, is, the, is, the, is the impact... Um, this move will create different drivers for for growth and development. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I, my view is is that whatever we do in the DC area, uh, I don't think in my lifetime the DC fund will actually ever get into the into the black. You know, and I think again that's an operational reality. So when I reflect on a few things and and. And this is a bit of an issue for me. You know, we we work really hard. Officers work really hard to to come out uh, with a ten year plan with with you know res, res, respectable <clears throat> um, uh, increases um, that that you know probably in, in our view are quantifiable, they're justifiable, um, um, but they're moderate and and um, and you know well researched. So here here we've managed to get to a position where we've said, oh, you know. We're going out for an average 7.09 rate increase. We've done a bloody good job. But, oh, hang on, wait one minute. We're just going to bloody put the crap around and have a crack at DCs. And this is why. I get that. But, you know, one of the things that we actually did, and I thought was a very pragmatic approach in the, in the long-term plan, was when we looked at the rating differential, for instance, and we actually decided, yes, we understand why that needs to happen, but let's phase that in over a three-year period. Now, what I think what, where I'm coming to is that actually... This this is a bit like trying to eat a stale date scone. If if you've got dentures, it'd be pretty difficult. Um, if you've got old teeth, it's even more difficult. But you know, couldn't we actually look at a situation where, understanding that we you know we we do need to move to um, 
to an area where there's less pressure on on rate par funding for for other general stuff that that um, could be potentially described as a user pays environment. Um, we've seen that in plenty of re areas in, in the recent long term plan where we've we've shifted, you know, um, some of the animal control, some of those we've just shifted them, you know, uh, moved them fractionally. And, and, and at a rate that's acceptable. So the question I'm asking is, is that if we say, just say, look at the increases that are proposed, proposed here and potentially stage them over, just say, just for example, a three-year period. So one, we're saying to the market, this is actually why we need to do this. So he's at the end of... Um, 2020, you know, whenever it is, the year, end of whatever, 25, this is what the fee is going to be. Get to the end of 26, this is what it will be. And by the time we get to 27, bingo, this is what it is. Now, I understand that that's going to create, well, again, if we're going to naval gaze and we go boom to boom, we might go like that to that. So, you know, in actual fact, it may not impact, what I'm suggesting may not impact the dollars per se, because instead of obliterating market growth and we have a staggered approach, we might not quite get obliterated market growth. So that's just my thought. And if you want to say that's a stupid bloody idea, feel free to do so. Um, the, Shame. The, the, the difficulty with that comparison is that with rating differentials, um, we're not changing the amount of money, all we're doing is shifting around who pays. So we still, as a council, get the same amount of money. If we phase the increase in development contribution costs, all we're doing is pushing those costs further out and they increase. So um, it's still, we've got to get the same amount of money in, but if we only get a third of what we need now, then the two thirds that we didn't collect money for compounds into next year, then into the next year, and then into the next year. So all you're doing is creating a bell wave. Yeah, and then, you know, it has to be put up. The only way with development contributions, because this is 100% user pays, is to either um, subsidise it or we don't do the growth works. And then we may well have to say to developers, sorry, you can't develop we can't put the infrastructure in because we can't afford it. You have a following question? Yeah. Thank you. So so I get what you're saying, but but I, I guess what I'm trying to say as well is that that market drivers will actually hugely impact our outcomes in terms of whether developers will actually take the plunge and when times are, you know, when 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 there's a depressed market. All I'm suggesting is that that if we soften that blow, are we likely to get some activity that drives some development contribution, brings in some money, rather than actually just say uh, nothing's happening for a couple of three years? That's the point I'm trying to make. You, you, and you will. What you do is you take the money that isn't funded and you push it to out of years. So you just add to the bow wave of more money that has to be repaid in future years. So say, for instance, we needed $100,000 worth of DC to fund growth works this year, and we said, oh, okay, we, we're going to cut back on our contributions, therefore we, we won't fund that, we will only fund half of it, and through contributions, the other funding's got to come from somewhere. We can't create capital works unless we pay for it. So it's got to either got to come, like I said before, it's either got to come through development contributions or it's got to come through some other source. And that other source that councils typically use is subsidy through loans and rates. Councillor Quarry. You want to make two comments? The first one is that if those proposed changes do go ahead, it'll skew the market towards, shall we say, rural sections where the, um, the demand for DCs is nowhere near as high. The second, if you go back to the previous chart where you had the, the blue and the pink going, the graph, yeah. 
that one there, you'll notice that there's a terrific number of sections that already have titles, and I take it have already paid their DCs. And so there's a, a, a very large bounce well of, of development that's been paid for, which hasn't taken place. Mm. And so you've got, what, five years supply of titles already there. Potentially. Yep. That's what the graph seems to indicate. A lot of subdivision, yeah. whether they've paid DCs, that would have at least been calculated against the resource consent. So and it will be paid there. at that lower level. Yep. So, you know, there's enormous back pressure building up already. Mm -hmm. This will only make it worse, of course. Thank you, Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Can I just go back to the catchment areas? I know we agreed on those some time ago. Did, did we look at separating out the Kawakawa industrial area separately? Can you sort of just explain how you would calculate with the model that we've got, how you would calculate DCs on a really large industrial site, like one or two that have gone in already, compared to a new house at the top end of town? So two, two parts to that, Councillor Short. So in terms of the catchment approach, the, the decision that was that was that was made was if you look at it as a as a as a, a linked up system, linked up network, you've got a water treatment plant with a reticulation network, you've got a wastewater reticulation network treatment plant. So so that they are one thing. Um, we did previously, if you go back 15, 10, 15 years, we had, I can't remember if it was seven or nine, it was nine different stormwater catchments. But ultimately, they all flow into the same system and they all um, ended up basically in the same place. And so the decision was made at the time to, to make that a single catchment as well. So whether you're building an industrial um, premises or a residential, the water comes from the same place, the wastewater goes to the same place, the stormwater goes through the same network. So that was the rationale for the, the wow. single catchment approach within urban fielding. And then outside of that, you've got the rural um, area and the villages. And what was mentioned before um, from Councillor Quarry, if, you, if you're building in the villages, you'll still have a capital contribution to pay for the three waters, but you only pay a development contribution for the roading and for parks and reserves. If you're, if you're building out in the in the rural areas, you'll only pay the rural, um, sorry, the roading and the parks and reserves charge, but then you'll need to put in your own water tank, your own septic tank, your own drainage system and the like. So whilst the costs don't get, get paid to council, there's still a cost regardless of what sort of system you work through. So that's the basis of the catchment approach. And then as, as I said um, earlier to council afford the and I think it's the second part of your question, is if you're building a large industrial building, you, you simply have multiples of a typical house. And so a, a 2,000 square metre roof and car park would be would be eight lots of a 300 square metre residential, for example. And so you pay eight times the DC for, for the uh, stormwater component. But you may only have one toilet, um, or, you know, for, for one office space, and therefore you'd pay one wastewater charge and potentially one water charge. And every single commercial or industrial building is 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 different, and so we work through that that equivalency to a typical house. But it all plugs into the same catchment, if you like. So, so there potentially, sorry, you know, there, there potentially is a um, an argument to look at the different differentials around the industrial park versus residential. Um, but I would I would suggest that they still flow into and out of the same networks, mm. whether it's waters or transport, and all that would do would put the DC up even higher for the industrial area, um, given the number of you number of units that will be recovered through that, which may fix potentially take the edge off a residential DC, but it will make it even more expensive uh, from a, from an industrial point of view. Thank you. You had a following question. Is it clear any if you look at it, is it fair and yeah, equal from a, from an infrastructure network point of view? Yes, yes. yes like I say, is. it all comes from the same place and goes to the same yeah. place. The trucks that drive on the roads, they're all connected um, across the network, and then you bring in the state highways as well. So I think the single catchment approach is a fair and equitable way of doing it, mm. and that's the current policy that we have. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Ford. Thank you, Richard. Um, when you were doing your um, contacting the other councils for the um, comparison work, 
and I understand the apples with oranges to Chevrolet cars, but did you get a feel for why a number of the other councils had their village and uh, rural DCs were significantly higher in some cases even than than their urban M, uh, their urban DCs and and certainly in um, comparison with ours. Yeah, and some thank you, um, Councillor Ford. And some of that comes back to the capital works that actually involved. Um, some involved quite significant um, roading upgrades. Um, in case of Mangafai, they've got quite a big stormwater issue um, which they need to address. So they rather can commit to the catchments. Um, so you look at some of these areas, they've got 17, 18 um, palms, I think has up to 21 sub catchments when you look at it. Um, the correlation which they then, rather than spreading it um, like we've done with our rural and villages, they decide that they actually separate it into the sub catchments and spread um, what could be often a larger cost over a smaller number of units and the belief that actually the people further up the road weren't going to make use of those services. So. Again, it comes down to that granularity of the catchments um, and the types of works that are actually associated with each catchment. Councillor McFadden. Uh, just to pick up on um, the question about the, the rule, of course they don't have water. So if they connect to a rural water scheme, or well, the majority of them, and it costs $8,500, so suddenly the development cost is virtually doubled if they wish to do that, because it's a separate charge. The second point is that I understand that Classic, for example, aren't paying capital contribution. So when we go back to the risk of developers, um, there's not a lot of de development sort of forecasted to come around residential in the next few years because a lot of that has already been built and it, therefore it, the charge will not be for the development of the section that, that they pay. The, the um, builder or the person that's going to build the house is then going to have to pay the capital contribution when they build the house, in effect. Is that correct? No. Uh, no. No? Okay. No. Um, no um, any developer has is, um, is exposed to development contributions, so um, be that at the time of subdivision or building descent. Um, our policy requires us to take the contribution at the early possible time, and usually that's subdivision. Uh, so, um, but then there is the ability and the policy for us to enter in developer agreements, and it may well be a developer uh, wishes to um, put their own infrastructure in place, pay for that, and then have a discussion with council around development contributions. So there are various ways sure. that we can have a conversation, but everybody is exposed to yeah. through this type of new development, um, development contributions. Thank you. Unless, Kat. of course, um, unless, of course, like Hamish says in the rural villages, they have a capital contribution rather than development contribution for those three waters. Thank you. Councillor Campbell. Yeah, look, it's fairly clear what the outcome is going to be by doubling, you know, development contributions and, and fielding, and that's pretty much the effect will be it'll kill off development in fielding. Um, yeah, especially with the current economic environment. We used to be able to get 500,000 for a section. Now you're lucky to get 300. Um, other costs have gone up, like surveying, roading, uh, you know, access, power, supply, fencing, all of those things have um, increased. Um, so, you know, I recognise that this, this area is complex. Uh, infrastructure costs a lot of money. Um, it has to be funded some, somehow. Uh, essentially, what we're saying at this time is that it's going to be unaffordable to um, for our community to be able to fund any um, future development. That's pretty much you know where where it's going to end up. Um, now, this this table here is you know interesting, but there's really only one council that matters on there, and that's Palmerston North City because uh, we've got to compare ourselves uh, you know closely to that. That's our economic difference. If Palmerston North is, is is cheaper than us to develop, that's where developers will go. Simple as that. And uh, and we won't get anything. So that's the only line that matters. We have to be uh, price appropriate in comparison to that one. Um, you forget the others, so too far away. And I don't think it, it's going to make any difference um, uh, where people go. But, you know, we've just got to keep in mind the economic impact of, of, of this. Um, by overpricing, it it means that 
you know, we won't get any development at all. And that, that reduces the infrastructure mm -hmm. funding we're going to collect as well. So it's, it's a compounding um, effect. Uh, it also affects, you know, the housing affordability, in fact, the housing supply for fielding. Um, if it's too affordable to develop, people just won't have houses, for, you know, available for people. So uh, the, these things we've just got to take in, take into account. Um, yeah, uh, that's I think my main points. But you know, I accept development costs are what they are. We we have to fund them somehow. Whether there's other opportunities to look at things, I think we're already using a degree of development agreements with. Um, large developers, is that correct? Yeah, we that do, one. but it's largely focused on the timing of the payments rather than just coming to an agreement around them funding infrastructure versus us putting the infrastructure in place. But it's to say that it, it's not a conversation we can't have, we just haven't had. Usually, usually it would have to be a fairly substantial development for us to have a conversation around installing the infrastructure, um, we wouldn't want the smaller developers only putting 200 metres of road in and then another developer another 200 metres of road and, you know, that sort of scenario doesn't doesn't wash for us. But, you know, a big developer such as Classic, then it is well worth having that conversation. Yeah. If I could add to that too, Shane, I mean, a developer agreement doesn't mean a developer gets it cheaper. It's just no. part of that open for business flexibility to work with those developers to help um, align their work programme and ours so it's not about a developer coming to us and telling us they want a bulk discount or anything like that. It's it's really yeah. about flexibility, not... Yeah, but they only work in, in cases of large-scale developments do, like yeah. Maywa, um, you know, on a single one, two, three, four lot allotment. <laughs> it's not worth bothering that. But the only other way to raise the money is through user fees, and that's, you know, putting individual rate pass charges up for wastewater rating contributions. So, you know, add... An, add and an effective for um, future growth. And yeah, just puts a burden back on on rate pass. So basically, where we're looking at at the moment is um, it's very likely we won't get any much development in the next few years. Um, pretty much, we're, we're yeah, it's not a place to build at the moment. Uh, Councillor Headfield. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. And just picking up on Councillor Quarry's early comment, and then Councillor Campbell's comment. You know, um. Councillor Quarry's comment around, um, you know, the forward supply in, in the uh, villages area, I think it's a very valid point. Mm. Um, and, and and if I missed it, do we have a bit of an idea of um, what that quantity is? And likewise, uh, in uh, the field and urban area, there's a lot of development being done down down there, and we build, you know, what 170 odd houses a year. How many sections are, are there down there that have actually already um, in the system in terms of actually having a DC set and what's our bow wave, you know, because actually when when I when I look at this, if we've got a reasonable bow wave in the, in the rural village sector and we've got a bit of a bow wave and it sounds like clearly we have with um, Classic, have, have we already got a bow wave that's taking us out two, three, four years in terms of actually availability of stuff that falls under the current, um, you know, fee structure, because that actually is, is a different story for me, you know. So if we've got capacity at the moment for the next two or three years, um, uh, you know, in terms of the the consents that have been given in the rural rural and villages, and and um, in in the fielding urban area this actually then doesn't become quite as dramatic in my view, if that makes sense. Yes, mm -hmm. it does. Councillor Quarry. Yeah, just in, in comparison, what would be the effect of, we've, we've got 100% now um, return, what would a 75-25, a 50-50 and a 25-75 effect be on rates? We would have to model that. Um, spending five or six million a year for example on average and you did 50 percent of that in rates then effectively you're borrowing two or three million a year and then paying the interest and depreciation on that mm -hmm. um for the next years no there would be no impact because we've already struck the rate 
Um, so we wouldn't be able to apply any sort of rates charge till for 12 months. Um, and the other thing is we haven't got capacity in our loan cap to do that. Mm. Uh, Councillor Ford. Thank you. Two things. One, can I just clarify that um, the classic development contributions are significantly different to other developers in Maiwa because of all the work that they're doing themselves? The, the contributions aren't different. The contributions are exactly what wherever we strike, but the arrangement we might come to around what they pay to put infrastructure in versus pay for existing growth work that's been incurred, that might be, the outcome might be they pay less for us, but they still have to incur the cost of the infrastructure. So mm. it's just how that works. Yeah, no, I'm um, talking about development contributions specifically. Yep. So we'll get significantly less from them because they're putting their own roads in. Potentially, yes. Mm. So it'll still cost them the same, but I'm talking about the income for us. Yes, but we also haven't got the expenditure of paying for the road. So. Our, yeah, our, our yeah. DC schedule. But, but they are the biggest developer in the in the district. It's you know the, the, yeah. there's a big yeah. sign up. Our, like six hundred and fifty sections coming soon. Yeah, but our current schedule, growth schedule, doesn't include any growth projects for classic developments. Yeah. The schedule you've yeah. got doesn't include anything for the. So I'm just trying to clarify that there is quite a diff, you know they are such a significant uh, part of this development uh, of of our district. And the DCs coming from there will be significantly different because they're doing a huge amount of the work themselves. Potentially, yes. Yeah, I just, I'm not sure that everyone's yep. aware of that. My, um, I just want the second point, picking up on Councillor Campbell's comment about the comparison with Palmerston, which I, which I agree with, that that is by far the most important comparison uh, or comparisons. Um, but then, <clears throat> and I think that we should also just be cognizant of the fact that um, Minister Bishop is making an announcement to the Real Estate Institute today about the need for the larger uh, cities, which I think includes Palmas North, to have to have to have um, 30 years worth of residential land zoned, um, and he's trying to bring the, the section price prices down by having a, a big supply. So if Palmas North's having to do that, and I'm picking that we probably don't because we're smaller. Um, that is just another factor, not not necessarily instantly because we're talking long term, but uh, that's another um, another influence on our market that will um, decrease the demand or the or the value of sections in our it makes it harder to um, get the, the higher development contributions or accept that the market is just going to slow even more. Councillor Short. Thank you. Um, just looking ahead to the consultation, I see in the comms plan you've got a uh, targeted consultation with known developers in the district. Has there been pre engagement already with them? Um, does targeted mean one on one conversations or does it mean getting them in as a group and going through it with them because this is such a significant change they will be using their lawyers to put their submissions in so we've got a number of approaches but um, uh, so I have a letter standing by um, signed by me to all of our developers that we have here um, alluding them to this process now, it depends on the outcome of today's meeting, mm -hmm. um, and we will. And Ross is doing a lot of work one on one with those developers, which Ross does through our the development navigator, uh, and um, we will be available for one on ones. We don't. I don't see that that's going to. We're going to gain much by getting uh, a, you know them all in. I think it's better to go um, come and see us one on one. We can sit down. And we can even then talk about their own personal sort of development <clears throat> as it suits them. Um, and yes, we will be we'll be we'll be doing a lot of that. So it was really important for us that we front foot this, no matter what it looks like. Yep. Uh, and the outcome might not be what people like, but we need to own it. We need to um, be on the front foot, and we need mm -hmm. to work with them to try and get to an outcome that be that whatever. Councillor McFadden. 
Thank you. I guess there's a couple of points I'd like to make, Your Worship. Um, first point, I, I get it, the fact that we've invested in inf infrastructure like the large diameter pipe, and we need to get a return on that. But then we look at somewhere like the Turners Road and industrial development, where we haven't invested a lot of money on stages two and three. And I guess I question then, is it, is it prudent that we sort of go ahead with that or whether we should put that under the microscope and say, given the economic circumstances, and there are unused sections in that area now, do we actually look at that to say, well, we take our um, debt cap pressure off that to be able to potentially suggest smooth out the development contributions over time? Just a question on that point. The second point that I have a con uh, question about is with a... With um, regional development announcement, is there an opportunity to put Turner's Road into a regional development and take potentially see whether we can ease um, that particular issue? And sorry, I've got one last thing. Thirdly, given that we're really not making any progress with the NZTA, is it prudent to put additional traffic onto into those Turner's Road area when we actually can't get, it, get the trucks, et cetera, across the road? Um, so, second one, which is the regional infrastructure fund or the fund that's being thing. Um, Hamish and um, the team are looking at whether we, whether we qualify with Turner's Road. Um, even if we don't, we reckon it's worth putting in, having a shot at, and perhaps the wider Precinct 5 might be an option. Um, and the reason we might look at that is it actually is part of Tu Tanganui, so we can leverage off that um, project and potentially there's the opportunity to complete the whole of Precinct 5. So the team's looking at that. Um, what was the third bit? Was around roading? I'll let Harm yeah. answer that one. But the, the irony with, with NZCA is is they probably won't spend the money until there's a reason to do it. And and I, and I agree that you probably, if you build Turner's Road, you put more demand on those intersections. Um, that will create a problem. The double edge to that sort is that problem then might trigger NZTA to to prioritise it as, a, as an investment. So yeah. that may or may not happen. It might just become a problem that we're stuck with um, based on how that money's been dished out around the countryside. But it would be it would certainly become an immediate issue for us for the for the first however many years yeah, yeah and going back to your original point around the timing of growth works um what i would like to suggest is perhaps you know going back to um something that council quarry said around 25 percent 50 percent order um perhaps you know over the next month during the consultation process the team can look at not so much the funding but what would happen if we didn't do 25% of the growth works or 50% of the growth works or Turner's Road wasn't in there or whatever, and that will give us some idea if it alters and how much it alters those development contribution figures, Thank um, you. if that's what Council wants. Well, I think, you know, we need all the information informed to be informed to make this final decision. Well, well, well I guess what I'm saying is, not so much. The information's all there. What I'm saying is if you want us to model several scenarios, then we can do that over the next few weeks. Yeah. Uh, Councillor McFadden. Thank you. I mean, Your Worship, um, I, my view is that given the state of our media, if we go out there to consultation and say we're looking at 104% increase, even if we don't adopt that, we won't be able to undo the perception so I would favour not going to consultation at this time and favour getting some more information. It's a public meeting. It's already out. It's already yeah. out. <laughs> uh, Councillor Hadfield. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just a couple of things on, on Councillor Short's uh, comment around um, consultation with known developers. I'm, I'm assuming uh, that that will include... Um, you know, the majority of the builders that build in the, in, the, in our region that, that buy sections, build spec houses, mm -hmm. do whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was the one thing. Um, and I'll just note, uh, Bishop's just released a statement. Um, six changes. The establishment of housing growth targets for Tier 1 and 2 councils. Which is clearly not us. No. Uh, Palmy, uh, Tier 1 and 2? Two. Two. Tier 2? Two? Two. Yep. Uh, new rules requiring cities to be allowed to expand outwards at the urban fringe 
a strengthening of the intensification provisions in the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, new rules requiring councils to enable mixed-use developments in cities, the abolition of minimum floor area and balcony requirements and new provisions for making the MDRS optional for councils. Mm. What's that? Medium density residential standards. Mm. So that's Bishop's little press release that's just come out. That's for just one on tier one or two councils. Aren't well, that, that, no, the establishment of housing growth targets for tier one and two. Yeah. So we won't get, by the, the way I read that is that we won't be lumbered with no. housing growth targets. Mm. So just in terms of, we, I, I think, you know, like, the, my view is, you know, I had, I had some real issues with this, you know, uh, reading this. Um, I, I guess, and I understand Councillor McFadgen's point, but at the end of the day, as Councillor Quarry says, public meeting, anybody can uh, listen to what we've, what we've mm. been saying. Um, so, so I accept, I don't necessarily, I, I haven't got my head around everything yet, to be fair, because I think the thing that as some of my colleagues have pointed out, we're missing... You know any any analytical um, sort of pie in the sky, pluck of the hand stuff on what the impact might be, but I think in that story, as I've already said, is is the forward bow wave. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a consultation, and I think um, I've come to the conclusion that actually, so long as we um, we do that really efficiently, and that we can have some actually. I think some sessions that elected members can also have with the development community. I think that would be useful mm, yeah. so that we, you know, mm. can get a feel for a group of people that are actually driving everything in this area, exactly what they're feeling. But at the end of the day, whatever happens, the final decision rests with council. Mm. Um, so I think if the consultation um, process is very inclusive and in we're able to be involved in that, that actually so that we're more informed than we would be from perhaps just getting a report. With all all due respect, I personally wouldn't mind a group of, um, in a, even in a workshop session or whatever, an informal session, a group of builders and developers being able to actually have discussions that we can understand. Now, I don't know what my colleagues think about that, but look, it is a consultation. The final choice is ours, still colleagues, and um, but let's hope we can do that from a position of being totally and exceptionally well informed about possible outcomes and what what drivers we might end up with from the development community. Thank you, Councillor Bell. I support Councillor Hadfield's sort of suggestion that elected members, we become more involved in the consultation process. When I reflect back to the LTP and our priorities that we gave to our community, there was nothing in there that made me incredibly nervous. This makes me nervous. When I was reading the notes and we look at the increases, it's kind of like, hey, do you guys know what a meme is? So it means like an infographic for young people and they have facial expressions. And it was literally like mouth wide open what the is going on here. This is what it feels like. And I think it's really important that we sort of manage the shock value that's going to happen and touching on Councillor McFadgen's point around um, really controlling the messaging that's going to happen. Um, I think irregardless, the media, we, we shouldn't be too concerned about the media. The media are going to do what they need to do. Um, and this is a public forum anyway, like other councillors have have said, but I think it's really important that we have a team effort between the operational team and the governance. And it's not that we don't trust you, um, but it's more that so we can support each other in the messaging. I think the messaging has to be really, really on point. I am really nervous at the time frame of the consultation. For me, I feel comfortable if we were to extend that, and I don't know what that means or what that looks like and what the impact of that is. I just think it's a really short time frame, um, and and I, I don't feel comfortable with that time frame for some reason. So if we can have a look at maybe extending that for a little bit, so it gives us the opportunity to make sure that we um, participate in the consultation and we do it well as elected members too. Councillor Ford. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, some talk about um, Turner's Road, Kawakawa Industrial Park. Um, I would be very reluctant to see that um, go on hold yet again. Uh, we've you know, it was going to happen 
four or five years ago. Still, still hasn't happened. There have been good reasons why it hasn't happened, and we've had to delay it even further mm -hmm. because of the um, as part of the LTP. Um, but this, but, but actually setting up some sites for business uh, can really contribute hugely to the growth of this community uh, with jobs, uh, not just housing. So um, I. I get nervous when I hear, "Oh, well, we, we'll just we'll just slow down Turner's Road again, or we'll not we'll push that back a few, a few years, or we'll stop doing some work there." I'd actually rather see some less work done on the residential because I think it's lower priority. But um, I'm not advocating either, to be clear. So I, just, I, I would not support um, deferring Turner's Road. Um, thank you. The the. Um... Yeah, I also accept that we need to go out for consultation with this, um, but I'm not happy with the development policy wording as it currently is going out with this. Um, if you look on page 59, I think given the current climate, I think it's quite arrogant of council to say that we consider the de level of development and financial contributions are affordable and do not consider it as likely to, that there will be undue or unreasonable impact on social, economic and cultural well-being of this section of our community. No way. Um, I wouldn't support that statement being in there at all. I'm, I'm assuming some of these statements and some of the others, like Councillor Bell talked about on page 56, they're just carried over from the previous policy. This policy needs to reflect the climate that we're in at the moment. Councillor Quarry. Yeah, thank you. My main gripe with DCs is that the expenditure of those DCs doesn't reflect the rural area that produced a substantial amount in regard to the DC. There's very, very little expenditure that comes back to the villages and the surrounding area. And that's one area I believe that should be an in, in engagement. There should be some greater expenditure of these DCs in the rural area or outside of fielding. When you go through and look at the last five years, and you look at the amount of money that's been generated, it's all been spent within the fielding bounds. And I'd like to see a greater percentage, I won't put a figure on it, but a greater percentage spent outside of fielding. And that's my main gripe with DC. Um, thank you, Shane. Can you just um, clarify? <laughs> so the, the consultation... Um, the shed, proposed schedule goes out with that as well? Yep. Okay. So that is open for consultation mm -hmm. and feedback? Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any further comments, discussion? Councillor Hadfield. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we're here to decide whether or not we actually go out for consultation. I think the detail of it is actually, you know, another day, another story, and I'll get that. Mm. Um, but, but I like Councillor Bell. I'm actually concerned about the one month consultation period and and I also would like to see that extended. Um, and uh, and if that causes issues um, um, for officers, I'd at least like to understand why um, because this this is actually the uh, <laughs> this is the one sledgehammer that you know we we could get a bit of tap on the knuckles with, I think. so. In in given, and, and I'm, I'm uncertain as to whether, um, you know, um, my view that we should be able to have some informal meetings with a group of developers, whether that can be fitted in. I know we've got no council meetings through July or anything, um, but I still think that's a useful thing. So I'd just like a bit of an indication, Shane, perhaps, whether or not um, you think some of those things are possible. So there's the timeline <coughs> on the screen. It's, excuse me. <coughs> has proposed, there's nothing to stop us pushing that consultation period out a couple more weeks. It just pushes everything else, of course, um, which means we don't get an approved fee until a bit later in the year. So the current fee, if you recall, we put a provision in the LTP fees and charges for the current fee to continue until um, this policy was adopted or new fees. It just means that we run at the existing fee until such time as we adopt the new one. Um, it, it's just that, you know, we just push it out. So um, I'm not sure what you are thinking, whether it's 
an extra two weeks, an extra month, or or what? Um, I'd like some guidance on that, but we can change those timelines to suit what council wants. Well, well, could I suggest you worship? Um, we've got we've got focus group meetings on the eighth of August. Um, so, if, if um, my my view is that that uh, I'd be quite comfortable for an infrastructure focus group to actually um, to be the the vehicle for um, perhaps uh, those mm. elected members of you know are on the infrastructure focus group, but also any elected members that attend that meeting, and that could actually be a discussion around this with key developers and builders. If that was to be, a, and if that was to be able to organise, actually, not sure about Councillor Bell, but I'd, if that fitted and that fits that time frame, I'd actually be comfortable with that chain. That's just a suggestion. Um, perhaps just as a suggestion, we look at extending that consultation period by a couple of weeks. Um, that just gives us the opportunity, if there's any feedback through the focus group for the team to be able to do some work or do something that council may want taken back to it rather than... Okay, so are you comfortable with the idea that we do that through the focus group? Yep. 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 Excellent. Thank you. Long everybody else is happy with that, that's fine. Yep. And um, Thank you. I think two weeks probably gives us a six-week consultation. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of recommendations there on page 25. Um, and recommendation one is that we consult on the proposed policy. Um, I'd like to see uh, added to that um, with updated, with amendments as we've discussed this morning, um, so that it makes it current and relevant to the economic climate and the discussion that we've been having. Um, if we're able to add the correct words to that motion. I'm not sure what words you want added to the motion, but um, the, um, the well, thing that the difficulty for us is that this, we we either approve this policy and then we update it as part of the consultation process. Um, yeah, because if we start trying to cover off all the alterations in a motion, then we might miss some or we might not. So I think as part of that consultation process, then we can update it. I guess my concern is, is that we, if we go out with the proposed document as we've got today, there are statements in there that are just simply not correct. Um, and, um, and, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable with those going out saying that, you know, we've got growth, we don't think there's going to be any impact, um, we're comfortable with that. Um, you know, I don't think that reflects what this council was saying. Council Short. Or could we say, um, with minor amendments uh, delegated to both the Chief Executive and the Mayor? Um, <clears throat> that's your call, but... Um... I'm, right. I'm just a little concerned that you know, we've got a policy sitting here that I don't really want us to say yes to the consultation, but subject to a whole lot of updating by by us that you might not have seen, and then we send it out for consultation. Um, I feel more comfortable that the council approves the documents going out for consultation rather than because um, um, there are, if you if if you think what her worship's saying, there are some, some quite not substantial changes, but it's quite a bit of updating, potentially. Well, it's in particular page 59116 and page 56. Um, are, are there two statements that we are making about growth, um, about growth and the impact of what we're proposing? There, to me, there are, do, there are two paragraphs that just need rewording to reflect the current environment. Um, I'm happy to take... Um, whether other elected members um, feel as strongly as I do about getting that wording correct, Councillor Hadfield. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Look, probably I don't actually, um, because at the end of the day, um, as, as much as 
everything's public. The only people that are really concerned about this are going to be the developers and builders, essentially. You know, the average rate payer, if it doesn't impact them, I don't think is going to, you know, be too concerned. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I would have thought our focus is actually with the people that actually do all this stuff, build, develop and build, um, but you know, look, I'm 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 easy either way, to be honest. I mean, if it's just a matter of actually tweaking two paragraphs, that might not be too difficult. But if it's if it's a matter of actually running through a whole lot of stuff, I think then we're going to probably um, um, put 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 the time frames even more under pressure. Yeah. I well, suspect. I, I thought you know, just having a quick chat with the team. Um, if council doesn't want to adopt this as it sits for um, consultation today and wants us to look at amending it, then I would prefer that it's left on the table and that we go away and amend the policy and bring back the policy um, for council to approve. That is the one that's going to go out for consultation. Thank you. Um, and I would support that. And um, Councillor Hadfield, I, absolutely, this document is for our development community. If you are a developer receiving this with the bad news and you read that statement on page 59 that we consider this is affordable and we don't consider there's going to be any unreasonable impact, is that the message we want to send? We, we've talked very carefully about the messaging that we put out with this, and this that statement contradicts what we've just talked about. Councillor Ford. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, um, I completely <laughs> agree that the wording needs to change. It's not a lot of changes. No. I'm happy for it to sit on the table. That I can't see what the panic is. Um, but actually, what we I can't I can't tolerate the view. Oh well, it's only consultation. So it doesn't really matter what we send out because, you know, we can always change it later. Yeah. Um, that's not what we get judged on. We no. get judged on what we send out for consultation. Mm. And so it's really important to get it right. I don't mind whether we pause and, and come up with some wording today or we leave it on the table to the next meeting, but it, that, there are a few things in there that, not a lot, a few things there that need to just change the messaging. How about, um, <clears throat> Councillor leaves it on the table, um, the team will go away, we'll have a look at it, we'll do a track change, we'll circulate it, and then we'll see um, um, about bringing it back to council when we can at the earliest possible time. Um, thank you. Uh, Lynn. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just want to make it clear that Ross sent the letter out from Shane last night so that mm -hmm. developers were aware that the paper um, was being discussed today and, of course, they've got a copy of the paper, a link to the paper, and also the um, policy as it stands now. So development, uh, so developers already have that. I don't think that excuses the fact that we're not comfortable with the wording in the document. Councillor Bell. Okay, Lynn, so can you, can you just, I want to confirm that I heard this right. Are you saying that what you've presented today, the developers already have? That's access to, and they've already absolutely is due yep. the public because oh. the public document. Can I public ask? Document. Is this normal process no, where we send out letters before it's approved here at governance? What our key messaging is around policies is that normal? So the, no. the reason it was sent out is we didn't want to surprise developers. It's public information. It was on the website that we were discussing it today. It's been recorded. It's up there. Um, there was nothing to hide. I respect that it's public, but we've notified them by giving them a letter. Yep. We've like look. Attention here, look at our amazing policy that um, has gaps in it. No, it's not what we said. We I said... know, but, but by giving a letter we've notified and yep. it's not mm. complete, it's not, it wasn't approved at this table yet. So that's no. why I'm asking, is this normal? Do we normally do this? Um, this we do we do have, we do notify, but this was quite a targeted front foot letter to vet to developers, not not to the whole community. I think I just want to acknowledge that. I'm not critiquing the team. What I'm acknowledging is the fact that this information is such a huge increase. Mm -hmm. This is this is this is not small. This is major. So we want to approach it in the severity that it is. We want to do it right. And so I actually support mm. the deputy mayor um, in making sure that we um, 
you know, we're, we're sensitive and we're delicate and mature when we approach our consultation. Mm. Yeah, and I think we are being that by letting them know what we're up to, what we're doing, what we're considering. So then I agree with you when you offer to the table that we'll leave it on the table, we won't approve it today, and then we will. Yep. Yep, so I support that. Councillor Campbell. Look, I think, you know, we've put a lot of work into this over a long time uh, and, and what we've, where we, I think where we've got to at the moment, we've established what we think the costs of um, building infrastructure is. Um, that's what it is. Probably, you know, it's not going to change the numbers, um, it, but it's a matter of how, you know, how we fund that. And, and so I think it's really important that we do have a really robust um, discussion with our developer community. Um, and that, you know, I'd be keen to have a really good consultation um, with them. Uh, this 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 allows that to happen, uh, where it means we, you know, we come back and we scrap mm. the whole thing, and go back to the drawing board. Well, maybe maybe that's the outcome. But um, we've got to have that discussion. You know, I'm I'm only a bit bit developer. <laughs> I've only done one in my life, so I don't know a lot of you know a lot about it. And it'd be the same with all the rest of us around the table. Uh, some of us have done uh, subdivisions, some haven't. So. Um, it's a complex area. We we need to be fully informed. We need to be working, uh, you know, an appropriate manner for our community as a whole, it, because it's it is a really important issue. It it, it affects our economic um, development and growth. Um, so you know the consultation is 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 very important, mm -hmm. but I fully agree that our wording, you know, as it stands, the DCs are not affordable. <laughs> For, for our community and they will absolutely stymie growth per my comments mm. earlier. But I, I'd be keen to have that consultation um, with, with the developers. Thank you. Councillor Hedfield. Um, clearly there's, there's just a couple of paragraphs in there that, that are causing a bit of angst. I mean, do, do we want to actually just fix that if that's what it is? Or do we want to delay this whole thing another month? That's the question I'm asking my colleagues. Right. Okay. Just fix it and fix it today and then move on. That would be my preference. Perhaps we um we should we take a break. Um that'll give the team here a chance to thank you. But I'd also things. like uh, particularly Councillor Ford, um, the uh, Councillor Bell and myself had identified some um, generic statements in there that didn't reflect the current environment. But Councillor Ford, you made a comment about um, potentially a few other things. Was there anything specific that you had picked up? I'll review it over morning tea. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Right, let's do that. Let's um, adjourn our meeting um, and be ready to start back at 10.2.
Yes. yes. Can you return? Oh. Uh, thank you, team. Um, reconvene our council meeting. Um, we're just wrapping up the agenda item, the consultation on the development of financial contributions. Um, we have put together some wording for a motion. We'll just get it up on the screen. Um, I'm and I will move that the council agrees to let the development and financial contributions policy 2024 attached as a, attachment one to this report, including schedules one, two, and three, lie on the table for a future council meeting. Do I have a second to please, Councillor McFadden? Any further discussion? Put the motion. All those in, uh, Councillor Ford. So for a future council meeting, is that four years' time or next? or next meeting, or what does that really mean? It means that we'll try and arrange a council meeting um, as soon as possible, rather than the schedule one August, but we don't know how that was going to sit with councillors. I know there's been a brief discussion at morning tea, but if we could have an extraordinary earlier, then we would. But if not, it'll be the next council meeting on one August. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have a mover and a second. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? No. Do you wish your vote to be recorded? Thank you. Thank you. The motion is carried. Thank you. May I suggest? Councillor Hedgeson. Um, that, uh, given, given that we lost that round, um, is that I, I'd just like to seek clarification from, from the Chief Executive that a council meeting now can have a quorum on Zoom. Is that correct or incorrect? Yes, we can yes, now. We can. Yes, we yes. can. So, so my suggestion then would be that, for the sake of whatever you're going to do, take out a couple of paragraphs. Basically, is that we organise a Zoom meeting, um, which will be very efficient because I think we've done everything we need to do. All we need to do is convene a meeting um, by Zoom. To go check, yes, let's do it and get on with it. Um, we'll arrange a meeting and it'll be up to councillors whether they want to join by Zoom or whether they want to pop in. But the meeting will be here because um, the public will be able to it come is, here it if will they be want. A formal meeting. Um, but yeah, if the preference is for join by Zoom, then you'll be most welcome to join by Zoom. Thank you. Uh, so that motion was carried. Um, thank you. The the next item is page 94. This is the application of common seal. Um, just notifying council of the documents that the common seal has been used under delegation. Um, you have those, the list there. Are there any questions or comments in relation to that? Councillor McFadgen. Um Thank you, Your Worship. I think the, where you signed it with the recent Chinese visitors is not on the schedule, the arrangement. You know, you were, um, that you did at the school. We, um... <laughs> <laughs> um, it wasn't an actual official one. Okay, that's fine. Take it. The seal, it just made it look official. Yeah, yeah it was a, something in a cuddle. Thank you. I don't know how else to put that, really. <laughs> Thank you. It was for lack of having a an alternative council stamp. Yeah, we we didn't think <laughs> it approved by the chief executive was appropriate. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Councillor Short. Um, some people's names appear on the list multiple times. Is that because of different warrants for different purposes? It is. It's not like one offs. They get a warrant to do one thing on a certain day at a certain place. Not, um, two reasons. Um, warrants are, are particular to a piece of legislation, and quite often to a particular paragraph or something in the legislation. Um, but also, we've had a number of name changes in our position. So as soon as the name changes to the job title, we got to reissue the warrant. Person stays the same, but the name change changes requires an update of warrant. Thank you. Uh, so there is a uh, recommendation on page 94. If I could have a mover and a seconder, please, Councillor Ford. 
I move that the schedule of sealed documents from 10 January to 5th of June 2024 be received. Thank you. Do I have a seconder, Councillor Quigley? Thank you. Uh, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Motion is carried. Thank you. Right, we have no later items, uh, and so I will move that the public be excluded from the following parts of the proceedings of this meeting, namely the confirmation of minutes. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor McFadgen. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you.